In my last two videos, I repaired a PS3 Super Slim and four controllers that I picked up from eBay. They're working great, but I wanted to make a few finishing touches to the console to really elevate the experience. Today, I'm going to clean the ports on the system, polish the glossy plates on top, repair some of the small pieces I broke during my teardown, and replace the original mechanical hard drive with a solid state drive. I'll also be making one final improvement that you'll have to watch to the end to see for yourself. Since I've already cleaned the inside of this system pretty thoroughly, cleaning the external ports should be easy. For something like this, I'll usually start by spraying some compressed air into the port, taking care to dislodge any clumps of dust or dirt which may be hidden deep inside, and then hit the port with a quick burst of contact cleaner. For especially dirty ports, starting with a small brush or other port cleaning tool before using compressed air and contact cleaner can be very helpful. You can also connect and disconnect something from the ports a few times after applying the contact cleaner to provide some mechanical action to clean the connections inside the port. These ports look pretty dirty, but they are all working, so this is just a light cleaning to make sure that I'm not damaging the contacts with friction from any fine particles. Next, I'm going to try and improve the appearance of these glossy plates on top of the console. They're severely scratched up, and I hope they'll serve as a good demonstration for the polishing process. I use this three-step system on shiny plastic parts like these. It was highly recommended by some other collectors. If you decide to use this product too, I would recommend using a clean microfiber cloth rather than the paper towel they provide and insist that you use. It seems too abrasive, and I've gotten bad results when using it on some other hardware in the past. Since these parts are pretty rough looking, I'll go through the whole process here. For fine scuffs or scratches, you may get acceptable results by using only one or two of the compounds. The instructions have us start by cleaning the surface to be polished using compound one. You just apply some to your cloth and wipe the surface using smooth circles until the entire surface has been covered and cleaned. Next, apply some compound three to a clean section of the cloth and wipe it over the surface at a right angle to the direction of the scratches. Since these are scratched in practically every direction, I used small circles again while spending some extra time polishing perpendicularly to the deeper scratches. After that, remove all the compound that's still on the work surface and apply compound 2 using small circles until it dries and leaves a sort of haze on the finish. This will probably take a few minutes, but it's worth it to take your time here and be thorough. Remove the second compound and finish by reapplying compound one as in the first step, then buff it off with a clean portion of your cloth. I had a difficult time here capturing the before and after. While this didn't make a big difference, the polished part definitely has a deeper color and brighter shine than the unpolished part. It looks jet black now, as opposed to a faded dark gray. I'd say this was just about worth it, but the results aren't as much of an improvement as I'd hoped. I think additional tools would be necessary to get a more thorough polish. Now that those parts have been polished, I'm going to repair some parts which broke during my teardown. The source I was using as a reference wasn't as complete as I had thought when I first reviewed it, and I ended up skipping some important steps it hadn't mentioned, which caused a few accidents. Luckily, none of these parts are critical to the console's function or structural integrity so I'm going to use a good quality super glue to repair them. I may be picky, but I think super glue is often applied in a way which isn't as strong or visually appealing as it could be, so I thought I'd share some of my techniques with you. I chose a gel type glue for this project to prevent overrun, but if you're careful and have the right tools, you should be fine with any quality super glue. The first thing to keep in mind is to use as little glue as possible and only apply it to one side of the broken surface, the glue is going to chemically react with the plastic and may discolor it, and the join won't be made stronger with extra glue. It'll also cure more quickly if there's less glue to dry. Applying the right amount of glue properly will address all of these points. One way to apply glue in a slow and controlled fashion is to squeeze a little out onto some foil so the glue reaches the end of the applicator tip before applying glue to your work. This will make the application much easier to control and prevent bubbles from building up and potentially spraying glue everywhere when they burst. You can also apply the glue to a toothpick, then use the toothpick to apply glue to the part. It pays to be careful and patient here. It's very easy to make a mistake and have the glue run out of control. And once it gets on your fingers, you only have a few seconds to free yourself before damaging your skin, your work, or its appearance in the final product. Once you've applied your glue, 
Just hold the glued piece to the rest of the part and hold it as still as you can for 30 seconds. Small parts may hold fast without help. Be careful not to wiggle the parts while the initial bond cures. After 30 seconds, the joint should be strong enough to hold the parts without any additional force and can be left to cure overnight. If you have a larger break or one or both parts you're repairing are heavy, you can try holding them together in a clamp or a vise while they cure if you have one available. For smaller parts, a rubber band may do the trick as well. I'm very happy with how these parts came out. Now we'll have to see how they hold up during reassembly. While I have this foil down, I also took the opportunity to apply some silicone lubricant to the gears and springs which ensure the door to the disk drive opens smoothly. This assembly wasn't especially dirty, but time had gummed it up a little, and I'd really like this door to operate as well as it did when it was new. After applying the lubricant, I worked the door back and forth a few times to make sure it spread evenly to all the parts. While it's hard to see the lubricant after it's been applied, this was enough to free up the door and get it opening smoothly again. Here's the upgrade I've been most excited for, the hard drive. Luckily, this is a very easy process and is totally sanctioned by Sony. Because there isn't any data I'm concerned about keeping on the old drive, I'm going to remove it, replace it with a solid state drive, and reinstall the system software on the new drive from scratch. If you want to do the same while keeping your data from the original hard drive, you'll need to back that data up first. Not all data can be copied to external media, so do your homework before continuing. While many people tout the speed improvements that SSDs can bring to games, my research has found the improvement is often dependent upon the game in question, and the first version of the SATA interface in the PS3 will limit the potential performance of this SSD. I'm performing this upgrade primarily with longevity in mind. The factors which typically limit the lifespan of a hard drive differ between mechanical and solid state drives. Mechanical hard drive lifespans are usually limited by the total number of start and stop cycles the spindle motor has performed while the longevity of solid state drives is often limited by the amount of data written to the chips within the drive. While both drives can be damaged by physical shock, solid state drives are often more resistant to it than mechanical hard drives. In the case of this PS3, the drive is mostly going to be read from, not written to, and may only be booted up for an hour or two at a time. Hopefully it won't be taking any tumbles, but I'll gladly take the extra insurance just in case. This leads me to expect that this solid state drive will last much longer in this application in a console of this age. There are also additional benefits to switching to an SSD, including reduced power usage and lower heat output, which aren't talked about as often. While there is some concern about SSDs, especially older models like this one, succumbing to bit rot faster than mechanical hard drives when left unpowered for years at a time, I'll be sure to follow up about the issue in a later video if that happens to me. Now that we've got plenty of reasons to swap this drive out, let's get to it. On this model, the hard drive is accessed by sliding this side panel off of the console and removing this blue screw. Once that's done, the hard drive tray can be pulled out easily using the swing out handle at the top. The hard drive can be removed from the tray by removing the four screws which hold it in. All we have to do now is reverse those directions with our SSD, paying attention to the orientation of the SATA connector on the drive, and we're ready for the next step. We need to prepare a flash drive with the data needed to install the PS3's system software on this replacement drive. This differs slightly depending on your operating system of choice, but the gist of the process is to format a 1GB or larger flash drive with the FAT32 file system, then create a folder on that drive labeled PS3 in all caps, and create a folder within PS3 called Update, again in all caps. Then search PS3 system software update in your web browser and choose the link to PlayStation.com. 
then scroll down to the section labeled Reinstall Using a Computer. Right-click on the Download PS3 Update button, click Save As, and save the update file somewhere on your computer, keeping the original name and extension. I recommend saving it to a location on your hard drive and not directly on the flash drive. If your browser complains about the file's safety, you're safe to continue the download as long as you've verified you're downloading the file from PlayStation.com. Once you've downloaded the update file, copy it to the update folder on your flash drive. With all three computers I used for this video, the copy operation took an extra minute or two to finish, so be patient and wait until your computer says the copy has finished before rejecting your flash drive. Connect your PS3 to your display, plug the flash drive into one of the system's USB ports, and power the console on. You'll be prompted to connect a controller with a USB cable, then press the PS button on the controller to start. Press Start and Select at the same time, then follow the directions and wait for the system to reboot. Once the format and installation are done, which should take around 5 minutes, you'll be prompted to complete the initial setup. After that, you'll be back at the system menu. Now you should be able to restore your old data if needed. That's all there is to it. The PS3 system storage has been handily modernized, and you'll be enjoying the benefits the future brings. With all the work I had planned now complete, this console has come a long way from how it arrived on my doorstep. I'm still holding out hope that I'll be able to find a replacement for the Sony logo on the front someday, but I'll have to keep waiting for now. This is YouTube after all. The video has to go live at some point, and I'd like to play video games from time to time too, not just make videos about them. Oh, of course, there's one last thing I'm missing. Now it's perfect. See? I told you you'd want to wait until the end. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know which PlayStation exclusives I should pick up first. Or, even better, share it with someone who can tell me which digital-only games I need to buy before Sony pulls the plug on the PS3's digital storefront. I'm Alex from Restore Revise, and I'll see you next time.